Welcome explorers! Thanks for joining me on this virtual field trip. My name is Stephanie and today we're diving into the world of ponds and macroinvertebrates. Now take a moment and just look at this pond behind me at the Nature Center. What do you hear? What do you see? Based on your observations that you just made, can you tell me what lives in this pond? If you said frogs, you would be right. I heard some frogs, did you? If you said birds, you would be right. I heard some birds too. Maybe you said fish or turtles, things that you know live in ponds, and you would be correct. But did anybody say water bugs? Yeah, I said bugs. An important part of the pond habitat is something called macroinvertebrates. And that's a big word, so I want you to say it with me. Macroinvertebrate. Macro means small. Not microscopic, you don't need a microscope to look at these creatures, but they are small, you can see them with your own eye. And an invertebrate is a creature without a backbone. Humans have backbones, we can feel that. If you take two fingers and you touch the back of your neck, you can feel that bone back there. Did you feel that? So we are not invertebrates. The creatures that we are exploring are. Basically, we're looking for pond bugs. And I wanna show you what some of these pond bugs look like before we dive in. Just keep in mind that the pictures I'm gonna show you are blown up images. We made them look bigger so you could really look at their features and their adaptations. So some of the things we might find today, and I have no clue, we never know what we're gonna pull out of our pond. We might find a back swimmer. These are some of my favorite because they look like they're rowing a boat. And one that kind of looks like them, but they don't swim on their back is the water boatman. So they get confused a lot, but these guys don't swim on their back, they swim on their belly. You might find water mites, which are these they look like tiny little red dots just circling in the water. We might find some ooey gooey frog eggs. I do hear the frogs out today, so they're probably laying eggs. And you know, there's there, our frogs, our little chorus frogs are really tiny, um, but they lay this big mass of eggs and they lay them onto grasses and things that are found in the pond. And they kind of look a little gooey like boogers, like a big chewy bunch of we might find some larvae of some of our flying insects, like our damselfly, which when he grows up, looks like that. Midge larvae are these little tiny fly-like creatures, and we see them, they're little red wiggly worms in the water. This is one of my favorites, the scud, and a very common one that we find. They look like little shrimp moving back and forth leeches. We do have leeches in our ponds, but don't fret. Leeches are mainly detritophores. Another big word, but basically that means they eat dead stuff and poop, which we totally need that in our homes, right? And then uh, a favorite of students is our predaceous diving beetle larva. He, he looks like Randall from Monsters, Inc. if you've ever seen that. That's what it looks like to me. But when he grows up, he actually looks like that. So these are some of the creatures we may find today as we go exploring our pond. Now to explore some of these creatures up close, we need to get them out of the pond. And to do that, we need a few tools. So I'm gonna show you what we use here at the Nature Center. And there are some options for you at home. If this is something you wanna do, make sure an adult is involved with you, okay? Because we are near bodies of water. So um, the first thing I'm gonna use is a net um, to catch our creatures. It's got really small holes in it. This is a pond net, but if you don't have something like this at home, and most people don't, I don't have this at home, only at the Nature Center, you can use one of those little green fishing nets that you get at an aquarium store. Um, and you, uh, it's important to also have a bowl of the water that you're taking the creature from. They can't live outside of the water very long um, and so if you want time to explore and watch them move and, and see how they 
use their adaptations, you're going to want to take a bowl and collect some of that water and put it in there. So I have already done that here. I also have a little magnify uh, box that I can kind of um, contain one of the creatures up close so I can put it into the box with some water and be able to look at it and really explore it um, closer. And then the last thing I'm using is an identification guide. Now we have all kinds of identification guides. Um, this is one of my favorites. It's very, very simple flip book that we have at the Nature Center that has all those pictures I showed you with the name. So it's super easy to use some of the most common species. They get a little bit more complicated. So here's one all on pond life. And I can use this to kind of identify and look at different plants and different species species that we might find in the water. Um, there is one that is on our website, so you can download it off of the Ogden Nature Center resource page. And um, it'll look closer to something like this, not quite this one, but again, just images of the creatures that you might find. Um, and just to show you, this is actually one created by a fifth grade student, an entire fifth grade class created um, ID guides for the Nature Center. They used them here, but they also let us keep them and they're amazing. So uh, anybody can create a flip guide and you can find them in lots of different places. Okay, it's time to explore, so join me. Wow, did you have any idea that there were this many bugs living in our pond? Come closer and take a look at what we found. Just in that five minutes that we were dipping our nets in and exploring, there's all sorts of different macro invertebrates. And these guys are super important. They are the food for those things you named earlier that live in the pond, the frogs and the fish and the turtles. And then of course, those are the things that feed the bigger things like the birds. So these guys have a super important role. Done exploring today, it's important to set these guys free. Put them back in the pond or the waterway where you found them. Now let's use our guide to see if we can identify some of these creatures. This is called a dichotomous key and scientists and naturalists will use something like this to find out creatures that they don't initially recognize or plants that they don't recognize right away. And we use it by asking a series of yes or no questions. So if we start at the top, I can find my creature and say, does it have a shell or no shell? And I follow the path that the question answers, right? So legs, does it have, uh, is it worm-like, is it microscopic? Obviously we're looking at macroinvertebrates, so I know it's not that one. And we can keep going down until it narrows it to exactly what we find. For this case, I'm just gonna use something simple. I'm gonna use this little guide that you can download from the Ogden Nature Center resource page. And basically, we're gonna look at the creatures and we're gonna see if we can match them to what we find in here. And I think you can help me with this. So I saw this guy in there a little bit ago. This is a damselfly larva. And I want you to take a look and see if you can find him too. Here's his picture. Let's see if you can find him in here. There he is. Did you see him? He's got little three little spikes to his abdomen here. Let's see if we can find another one. I saw this one in there too. This is a scud. See if you can find him. Did you find him yet? There he is, spinning around in a little circle. Oh, this is a great find. How many of you saw that? This whoop, is a dragonfly nymph, and we're gonna talk about him next. This is a dragonfly nymph. This is what we were looking at, and this is the immature, I think juvenile or baby form of the dragonfly you know and love. Now, in order to get from this to this, this creature goes through metamorphosis. It actually changes its body. So it spends the first two years of his life looking like this nymph here. And then 
after those two years, it actually crawls onto a, a branch or a stick or a plant that's in the water and it breaks out of its old exoskeleton and ends up coming out and looking like this. And they live for about two weeks or so. Each dragonfly species is a little different, but they can live, um, they mainly fly around and lay their eggs, like eat a lot of mosquitoes first, and then they lay their eggs out on the pond water. And when they hatch, again, you have a dragonfly midge. Let's explore metamorphosis in greater detail. And for this, I need a friend. So I'm going to invite Sarah, a fellow naturalist here at the Nature Center to join me. And we are going to dress Sarah up, make her look a little funny so that help you understand metamorphosis a little bit better. So first thing we need to do is we need to make Sarah a true insect. So for to be a true insect, she needs a head, check. She needs a thorax, which is a middle part. So we're gonna give her a middle part. And the thorax has some extra legs on it because true insects have six legs. So now if we count her arms, she's got six legs. We won't pretend those are legs. You need something to say. Uh, another body part she needs is an abdomen. So we're gonna give her an abdomen. She can tie that around her waist. So now that you have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, we're gonna give you a set of antenna, and you're a true bug. But if we threw Sarah into our pond, would she be able to survive? Do you remember how long I said dragonflies live underwater? If you said two years, you're correct. Sarah, how long can you hold your breath? 60 seconds. I don't think that's going to cut it for two years. So we need to give you some adaptations. An adaptation is something an animal has or does to help it survive in its home. In this case, we need to help Sarah survive in the pond underwater for two years. You're going to need to be able to breathe underwater. Mm -hmm. Do you know how fish breathe underwater? Gills. And our dragonfly nymph has gills too, except the gills are located on the abdomen. So go ahead and pin that on your bottom. Maybe on the bottom of the... <laughs> I'll help you. There you go. There's your, there's your gills. So now she can breathe underwater. Yay! <sighs> Is that the only thing that Sarah needs to do underwater? Hmm. What else? would she need to be able to do to stay alive? If you said moving, you're correct. She needs to be able to move. So we're going to give her a set of paddles. And Sarah, these open up just like that. And you're gonna put those on. And the great thing about these paddles is they're also pinchers, which means that Sarah can defend herself and she can hunt for food with them. So they work double duty there, right? So Sarah can now breathe underwater and she can defend herself, she can find food, and she can move around. Is there anything else we can give her? If you said seeing or sight, you are correct. She needs a pair of goggle-like eyes. Lots of creatures that live under the water have goggle-like eyes. That helps protect their, um, their body, but it also actually works and allows them to see underwater. Have you ever used goggles in a swimming pool? Did it help you see around you? Sarah, you're looking really good there. <laughs> I think it's time to throw her in the pond. What do you guys think? No? Okay, we won't put you in the pond. So Sarah is prepared to live for two years underwater. But dragonflies don't spend their entire life underwater, just those first two years. Then they need to stay on land. And to do that, you're gonna need different adaptations. Is there anything you can think of on her that she no longer needs if she's going to live on land? You're right, she doesn't need to breathe underwater, so we're going to get rid of her gills. She doesn't need to move underwater, so we're gonna give her some landing gear. And of course, she doesn't need to see underwater, but she still needs to be able to see. So we're gonna trade your eyes out. This is what happens when um, insects like the dragonfly nymph go through metamorphosis. They actually change some of their body parts. So if you give me your goggle eyes, which are good for seeing underwater, I'm gonna give you compound eyes. 
compound dyes are good for insects, mainly flying insects, because it helps them see movement. Think about it. Have you ever tried to catch a fly and you couldn't get it? Right when you went to grab it, it flew away, right? That's because of these special eyes that can detect the slightest movement around them. So that's what those are good for. Is there anything that's missing on our dragonfly that now lives on land? Wings. Sarah needs wings. Let's see, Sarah. I don't know if you're going to be able to put these on by yourself. <laughs> these are pretty colorful wings. Have you ever seen a dragonfly which has such beautiful wings? There you go. Sarah is now set to fly around and eat mosquitoes and most importantly to lay her eggs back on the pond so that a new generation of dragonflies can be born. Thanks, Sarah. Lots of things like our dragonfly live on, in, or around ponds and other waterways like lakes and rivers and streams. And so if you want to try something fun, Go on to our resource page and download the pond scavenger hunt. Challenge yourself to find out what lives near the water near you. Thank you for coming on our virtual field trip exploring ponds and macroinvertebrates. I'll see you at the center.